Thank you very much, Father. And brethren, your grace, your blessing, and uh, Holy Fathers, thank you for having me here tonight. It's a great joy and a great blessing. Christ is in our midst. He is in the Tonight we're going to talk about the spiritual priorities of the spirit in our spiritual life as pilgrims on the path to heaven. And the first question we all have to answer, we're all Orthodox Christians, we're baptized. We're, for the most part, I'm assuming, and we are in the church. And we've received in, as a seed, the paradise that the Lord wants for us, the kingdom of heaven. But whether it is activated, whether it is real to us, that is going to depend on our struggle. And so the question we have to ask is, what are we seeking? What is sought by Christians and what is sought by the world? We said in our, uh, the title of our talk tonight is, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, the spiritual priorities of pilgrims on the path to heaven. So the first thing is we are pilgrims here. We are temporary. This life is short. And death is at the door for all of us, whether we live another 50 or 100 years. It is nothing before eternity. All of us are here as if in a twinkle of an eye and we're leaving. And if we have this understanding, this sense about this life, immediately we understand that we are pilgrims on this path. And the question is, what do we seek from this life? Where is our heart? To what is it had, ha, have we given our heart? These are questions we all have to ask and answer. Where is our heart? To what have we given our heart in this world? What do we love? Ask that question of yourself and answer it and then compare it to what the Lord says in His Gospel. We're going to talk about that and His Gospel tonight. Much of what I'm going to tell you is going to be familiar and it's going to be from our Lord because my job here tonight is not to say what I think. It's not to say what uh, uh, insights that I've had or, or, or anything of the sort. It is to give you the Lord's Word and to help understand it in more simple terms for each one of us. So again, where is our heart? Where is our gaze fixed? On what are our eyes of our mind concentrated? What consolation do we want from this world? Where do we seek consolation? All of us seek consolation. There is not a human being that is born in this world that is not seeking consolation because this world is harsh. This life is difficult. It's a valley of tears, and everyone is seeking consolation. Some more than others. Some have suffered more than others. But everything we do, including in a little while we're going to go eat and drink, and that is a consolation. Some of it is blessed, and if we use it correctly, it is the Lord's blessing and a gift to us. When we do not use it correctly, when we do not have those consolations as in the context of our life in Christ, then they become obstacles to true consolation. For the true consolation, the lasting, eternal consolation, we must turn to He who is eternity. We want eternal consolation, we turn to the, the one who is eternal, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Lis listen to the eternal incarnate truth speak to our hearts and learn from him how to hierarchize, how to prioritize and regain our first love, our first love that we lost in paradise. Listen to the words of our Lord and then we'll talk about it. He says, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what shall you put on? Is not the life more than meat, the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Why take ye thought for raiment, clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. 
And yet I say unto you that not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, <coughs> shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Take therefore no thought, three times he says, three times he says, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewith shall we be clothed? He takes the most simple things that we all need. How much more, and we'll talk about this, how much more all those things that we have in this world today that we fill our life with is great distractions from our true love. How much more of those things? He says, what we eat, who does not eat? What we drink, who does not drink? What we put on our clothing, who is, walks through this world without clothing? Every one of us. He takes the most basic things. But how many more things in our day and age have we filled with our life? He says, where will you be clothed? Why, why do you take thought for this? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. Who are the Gentiles? The idol worshipers. Do you think we don't have idol worshipers today? We have more idol worshipers today than in our Lord's day. The world is filled with idol worshiping. Just not the kind of idols that you see in the religions of the world. There are other kind of idols. But those exist too. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Why you take thought? And here is the key line. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Here is the order of things. Listen carefully. If you don't understand this order, you'll never reach heaven. The order of things. First, the kingdom of heaven. All else comes after that. Do we have this priority in our life? How do we judge and what criteria do we have as we walk through this world? When we decide what to do with our day, when we decide when to get up in the morning, when we decide whether to go to church in the evening on Saturday or on Sunday or the feast days or the pre-sanctified pre, pre liturgy. What is our criteria? What is our priority? And then we will reveal to ourselves. You see, we have to come to self-knowledge or this is all for naught. We can be a Christian and come to church, but if we have no self-knowledge of where we are in relation to what the Lord is calling us, we will walk in a haze through this world and we will have no benefit. Let's prioritize things. Take therefore no thought, third time, take no thought, he says, for the morrow, for tomorrow. For tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. It's enough the evil that will come tomorrow. Think not of it. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. This is Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Again, I draw your attention four times, five times, I'm sorry, not three, five times. Take no thought for your life. Take no thought for the raiment. Take no thought saying, what shall we eat? Again, he says at the end, take no thought for tomorrow. And why so much focus on the thought? Because this is the beginning and end of our lives. If we, the, the in Greek, igomon nous, the ruling intellect or the spiritual intellect, the heart, the eye of the soul, different words we have for this, this same reality, the, the, the center of our being. If it, is, if it is given over to thinking on created order, the created world, how can it commune with the uncreated? It begins here in cultivating thoughts that are, uh, are going to open up the kingdom to us. So the question then is, what are we seeking? He says, seek the kingdom of heaven before all else. And we have to ask ourselves, what are we seeking? The presupposition here is that we're seeking. Are we seeking? What are we seeking? Many of us go through this life of materialism that we live in today, this world that is sunk into seeking the things of this world. And we go from desire to desire, from earthly need to earthly need, from sleep to to eat, to sleep, and this is the sum, sum of our life. And so we don't seek anything except our own ple pleasure, and it's very temporary. In Acts, we read that they should seek the Lord 
if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. He is the presence of God. None of us tonight is outside the presence of God. We are all in the presence of God. What's the difference between those who are in the presence of God unto eternity and unto life eternal and unto paradise? And those who are in the presence of God and that presence burns. That presence does not bring life but sadness, the grinding of the teeth that the Lord talks about. It is depending on us and how we turn to Him and how we embrace Him. This is the question. Our salvation is lost or gained depending on our decisions, our every decision. It's not just the big decision, I became Orthodox. I was brought up in an Orthodox family, therefore I am on the path of salvation. This is delusion. The question is every day, every thought, every, every moment of, the, of our life, we are at a crossroads. What will we do? What will we think? How will we approach our life and how will we use the time that has been given to us? Christ is in our midst. The question is, are we in His? Are we responding to His calling? It says elsewhere in the Gospel, And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. The presupposition, again, is that we are seeking. Knock, and it shall be opened. The door that we're knocking at is our own heart. The kingdom of heaven that his, He is giving to us is within. He says elsewhere, Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it. And the point here is, for those earthly things, when we lose money, we seek, do we not? Until we find it. But the kingdom of God, communion with Him. But even if we seek, we should never forget that He first sought us. He first came to us. And without that condescension, there is no salvation. You remember what it says at the incarnation, the people sat in darkness and saw a great light. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The mercy of the Lord will pursue us all the days of our life. This is our Lord. He has sought us out first. And now we come and we respond to His great love for us. So what do we seek? Let's ask an answer with the Gospel. A sign? A miracle? Magic? Many of us Unfortunately, because we have not entered into the mind of Christ, we understand the life in Christ in magical terms. We think that the priest is a magician. And if we commune often, suddenly we have the kingdom of God within us. It does not work that way, brothers and sisters. We have to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, and mind. And then His presence, which we're all in right now, and every day of our life, becomes real to us. Remember the Pharisees, they come forth and began to question the Lord, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he says, no sign will be given to this generation. No sign, because they have no eyes to see. The Jews seek after a sign, he says. The Greeks seek after wisdom. The question is, what do we seek? Do we seek a sign, meaning what Dostoevsky will later say, circuses, bread and circuses earthly sustenance. The Lord says somewhere, ye seek me, he says, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. Do we come to the Lord for our, our earthly satisfaction? There are not a few Christians who see the Lord as a means for this world's happiness. They go and run to the church when they have need. They go and run to the church when there's a a commemoration. They go and run to the church to have their articlesia, the bread and the wine, they offer it on the behalf of some earthly need. Is that good? Of course it is. But it is not enough. If we're only seeking the Lord for this earthly world, our salvation is in this world and we will not have eternal life with Him. It has to be the hierarchy of things has to be correct. We seek those things and He will give it to us. He is our Father. He loves us. But He doesn't, this is not why He came to make our life easier and better in this world. This is very foolish if this is why we run to our Lord. Why do we run and seek after the Lord? For physical comfort and ease? He says somewhere, whosoever shall seek to save his life will lose it. 
and whoever will lose his life will preserve it. If we're seeking again for this life to be to have a good home, uh, security, economic, uh, the, our brother, our our children in a good college, uh, and all the rest that this brief life gives us, if that's really what the church is for us, the means to attain those things, then we have yet to come to a knowledge of God. We have no continuing city, he says, but we seek one is to come. This stance is very important. We're going to talk about that in a second. Let me not get ahead of myself. The stance of it's an eschatological, the, 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 the theologians would call it an eschatological stance. We seek, we stand with our gaze to heaven. But the path which leads to heaven, this true life is very narrow, self-denial. It's full of pain of heart, which is true love. We talk about love so much in the world today, we don't understand, most of us, what love is about. We have been, the propaganda and the, the media teaches us to us about love, and it really is nothing but love, because there is no truth involved. You cannot separate truth and love. So true love is sacrifice. True love is pain of heart. And this true life that we seek, it's narrow it means struggle without a struggle though there is no one is crowned and there's no refinement without a struggle right there's no there's no purification without the struggle without the ascesis and tears tears which purify us the lord says strive to enter into the straight gate for many i say unto you will enter to seek to enter and they will not be able how is it that one seeks to enter but is not able how is that possible? What does that tell us? That it's not enough to seek, it's also, nece it's also necessary to understand the methodology and the, the way in which we enter the kingdom of God. We have to be initiated into the way of Christ, not just to have a good desire. Many of us think that salvation is a good desire or to be a good person. This is not salvation. We'll talk about what is salvation. He says elsewhere, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent taken by force. What is this violence? If we seek the kingdom of heaven, and he tells us that we have to do violence to enter it, we want to know what that is, because we want to enter the kingdom of heaven. What is this violence? This violence is self-denial, it's asceticism, it is putting off the old man and his passions, and to enter into that kingdom which is given to us, the grace of God, that cannot happen when we are walking the broad, easy path of comfort and of self-satisfaction. So we have to do violence to the passions. It's an internal uh, violence on our own desires. So for one to voluntarily tread this path, it means that they have obtained a good uneasiness. Let me express this. This is a very important phrase. We find it in Elder Baisio, St. Baisio the Athenite. And it is encapsulates this, this sense of that we're missing eternal life, that we are missing the fullness and the abundant life that God seeks for us. And that means we need to go deeper. We need to abandon superficiality, vanity. We need to abandon that which does not heal the whole man. We want total healing in our mind, soul, heart, and body. Whatever obstructs that, we need to abandon it. And it's the good uneasiness, not being satisfied, not being at peace with this world. Uh, this not being satisfied with this temporary and uh, the pleasures and consolations that the world gives us. That we're not, when we go, when we, when we feed our face and we fill our stomach, this does not satisfy us at the end of the day. We still seek something much deeper. Uh, that we seek true life, not among the spiritual dead and the corrupt, according to the word of the apostle, St. Paul says, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And so this is the eschatological stance that we all have to have. Where are we looking? Where is Christ? He's at the right hand of the Father. That's where we're looking. We want to be with Him. The human nature, our human nature, sits at the right hand of God. And that's where we're looking in our whole life. 
And we have to ask ourselves, well, what is this, this heaven that we're gazing upon, that we want to enter in, this kingdom of heaven? So we, we talked about seeking, and now we're going to talk about what we're seeking, the kingdom of heaven. And what is the kingdom of heaven? We hear this all the time, but do we understand what it is? Is it a place? Is it uh, an external rule? In the Middle Ages, there were Protestants and others who thought that the kingdom of heaven was some kind of earthly paradise. There are many <coughs> deluded, heretical Christians today who believe that Christ will come again on earth and rule. And this is a tragedy because this is what the Jews believed. And that's why they, one of the reasons why they crucified our Lord, because they expected an earthly king, just like they do today. Just like they do today. The Jews are, are waiting for an earthly king, an earthly kingdom, to put their, their race at the top of the pyramid of humanity. This is delusion. The kingdom of God, brothers and sisters, is Christ himself. He comes and dwells in us. He brings himself within us. This communion is the kingdom of God. This is salvation. He himself is heaven. So when he dwells within us and we dwell within him, it's two people. Both are necessary. Both need to love for this kingdom to be realized within us. Then we have the kingdom of heaven. We're already, we're already in heaven in this world. And if we're not in heaven in this world, we're not going to be in heaven in the next. It happens here or it doesn't happen. After the body, after the soul departs the body, there is no more repentance, St. John Damascus talks about and says in Hades. There is no more repentance. Why? Because repentance is a change of one's whole orientation, body and soul. The whole man repents. We enter in this world, when we have communion with Christ, into heaven. But this is impossible if we do not first change and say yes. The mother of God who said yes to the archangel, we all have to do the same. She is not the exception, she is our example. She leads the way for humanity into the kingdom of heaven. And what did she say when the archangel came? Yes, let it be according to thy will. She submitted to God in everything. And every true Christian who lives the kingdom of God submits to the church, to Christ, in everything. Without this disposition of soul, there is no kingdom of heaven. So this is a prerequisite, that we are repenting. But what is repentance? How many of us understand what repentance is really all about? We have been affected, we have been infected by the Protestant understanding of a lot of the words we use in the church. Repentance in this culture does not mean what it means when our Lord uses it. It usually means remorse. I feel bad about something. If you ask most people, what does it mean to repent? What does it mean to have repentance or forgiveness? It means to not feel bad about something. It means not to hold a grudge. It means to uh, feel, to, to try to go back and do something better. Uh, none of that really expresses true repentance in the church. It says in the scriptures, from the time that Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. This is how he begins. And this is how we must begin our life. But it doesn't, it's not a beginning that, that has any end. There's no, there's no end to repentance because there's no end to return to God. God is eternal. God is endless. So how can there be an end to our repentance? In fact, repentance is not a one-time decision. It's a change that never goes back. It never changes back again. We change our orientation. If you look at the Greek, the Greek is metania, metania, to change the noose. And many people think, and we, in, in, in English, we say change of mind, but that's not really correct. It's not a change of mind in the sense of our rational intellect. And what's our rational intellect? It's, 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 the, it's the tool that gave, God gave us to get through this world. It's what we use to count. It's what we use to, to, to reason. It's our logic. That is not the organ of communion with God. We commune with God in our noose, which is properly translated either as our, the eye of our soul or our heart, our spiritual heart, or even our spirit. In Scripture, St. Paul uses it 
and interchangeably with our spirit. So here you can see the whole man has to change, not just our rational intellect. Our whole stance has to change. Our whole way of being has to change if we're going to unite with he who is, the one who is. And we have examples of true repentance in the scripture. We have an example of false repentance or the lack of repentance in the scripture. We have Judas on the one hand and Peter on the other. Judas had remorse, not repentance. He felt very bad about what he did and then he hung himself and never was in communion with God again. Remorse does not save. Feeling bad about your sins does not save. Those who say, I can go to my icon corner and confess my sins are in great delusion. The question there is not feeling bad. The question is, how do you return to God and where? Because God became man incarnate and you have to go to him somewhere in this world or you do not have communion with him. We are flesh and soul. We are not just flesh. We have, or not just soul, we have both. And so we need to commune with him where? In the Eucharist. But how do we go to the Eucharist? By the path of repentance. And that reconciliation happens in the sacrament of confession. Later on, in the, toward the end of his mission in this world, the Lord turned to the disciples and said, The kingdom of God is given to you. How? By the remission of sins. You, it's up to you, the apostles, to remit or not to remit. This is the amazing, mind-boggling authority which God gave to men, but not just any men, deified, theanthropic men, who work under his guidance and under his noose. He is the, he is the head of the church. And so Judas did not repent. Peter repented. He wept and he returned to Christ. He went back to communion with Christ. That's when there's repentance. If you, do, if you do a sin that takes you out of communion with God, and there are many today which we do, which we do not realize that take us out of communion with God, the Spirit of God is very sensitive, and He does not dwell where there is lies, delusions, corruptions. He wants to be in a pure vessel, and He wants us to be united to Him. So, we have to go back to Him. We have to repent and go back into communion. The Greek word for forgiveness shows us what repentance is really all about. It's synchordacy. And synchordacy in Greek means to be in the same place, to be in the communion, essentially. So if you are forgiven, you are in communion. If you have repented and it is, you've returned to Christ, you are in communion. We have the example of the prodigal son. When did the prodigal son repent? The prodigal son, as you know, left the father's house, went to a far country. He was, spent all his inheritance, all his spiritual wealth, became impoverished because of sin. The devil, a man in the far country, came to him and assisted him to work for him. What does it mean to work for the devil? To do sin, to go about doing the works of the passions. In the midst of this alienation, this exile, he comes to himself, he begins to repent. He comes to self-knowledge. But not, not yet is this communion. This is not repentance yet. He comes to himself and he realizes that I am far from my father's house. I am far from communion with God. I get up. I leave the pigsty of the sins behind. I make the path toward the father's house. When does this repentance end when he embraces the Father. When does that happen? In eternity. And even then it never ends because there's always more communion, deeper and fuller. So repentance is getting up but not turning back. It's getting up and going to communion. It's a process and it never ends. So no one can say here, I have no need of confession. They are deluded if they think that they have no need of confession. Because that means they are sinless. And who is sinless? There is one who is sinless. We all need to go to confession. But not just to go to confession and say our sins, but to repent. That means to enter back into communion with God. To have a intimate, direct communion with the person of Christ. So it's communion of soul and body. What does our Lord say? Verily I say unto you, 
Except to be born of water and the Spirit, he could not enter the kingdom of God. And he says elsewhere, when they believed, in Acts of the Apostles, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, this is the basis of communion, lest we be deluded by the contemporary ecumenism and secularism and, and uh, syncretism of our day. The basis of our communion with God is recognition of who he is. That means confession of him as Christ. That means our faith, the Orthodox faith. When they believed, it says, the preaching of Philip concerning what the kingdom of God Christ come in power the name of Jesus Christ they believed in him then they were baptized both men and women so this is the beginning of the kingdom of heaven baptism but baptism is not something that exists in a vacuum or exists in isolation it is incomprehensible outside the whole of the life of the church and especially the Eucharist so one who is baptized it means of course that they are immediately initiated into the Eucharist there's this delusion going around among our friendly ecumenists in the church tragically they think that baptism can exist apart from the Eucharist meaning among the heterodox there are no baptized Orthodox Christians outside of the Eucharist. There is no baptized Christian. It is in, it, it, incomprehensible to talk about baptism apart from chrismation and the Eucharist. It exists so that one communes in the mysteries. It doesn't have any meaning outside of that Eucharistic context. Both and in the Orthodox Church. There's never one or the other. It's both and in our Orthodox theology. So it's all or nothing. There's not anyone in the church that is spiritually just a little bit pregnant. Doesn't exist. You're either pregnant with the, with the Spirit of God and in communion with God, or you are not. And this is the reality of the presence of God. He's all in all. Do you know that when you commune, you do not commune of a part of the body of Christ? The servant of God partakes of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no division in the body of Christ. It is all or nothing. He is not divided. He is undividedly divided, it says in, in St. Gregory of Palamas. What does that mean? In St. Gregory the Theologian. That he is distributed to each one of us without any division. It's a mystery. And this is the unity of the church. We receive the whole Christ. And we are baptized into the whole Christ. And there is no division in the body. So this mystery, this indwelling of Christ, of course, is internal not external. The Pharisees were looking for a worldly kingdom. It says in the scriptures, he was, when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when will the kingdom of God come, they asked. And he said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. It cometh not with observation. This is an internal reality, a spiritual reality. And he says elsewhere, neither say they lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Just like at the end of time, the Lord will come back and they will say, here is Christ and there is Christ. Do not follow after them, he says. Do not follow after them. This is not how Christ will come. And this is not how Christ comes in our life. It is a mystery and it is revealed to those who are initiated. And it is a closed book for those who are not. What is the sign of the kingdom then, if this mystery is internal? How do we know? If we're going through all the motions, does that mean we're in the kingdom of God? If we're communing every weekend, are we in the kingdom of God? If we're doing all the right things, are we in the kingdom of God? Not necessarily. There's a sign of the kingdom of God, and it's the healing of our soul and body. The church does not exist as a club of the saved, of the special people in the world. It's a place of repentance. It's a hospital where people are getting well. If you're on the path of salvation in this church, you are getting well. The passions are leaving you step by step under the direction of a spiritual father. You're getting well spiritually. Are you getting well spiritually? Are you being healed? That's a sign of the kingdom of God. Jesus, it says, went about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness. This is a sign of the kingdom of God within us. When the sickness of sin of passions is done away. If we do all ma manner of pious acts, 
We commune frequently. We even give our body to be burnt, it says, according to St. Paul. But we have not love, that is, the fruit of love, which is healing of sin and corruption. We run in vain. Many people misunderstand the ascetic life. They think the ascetic life is only for the monks. How many times did I hear in Greece as a priest, Father, why do you always talk about Banathos? Why do you always compare us with the monks? Why do you bring this in? We are not monks. As if there is two gospels, two paths, one for the monks and one for the lay people. There is not. There is only one gospel. There is only one path to salvation. There is only the acquisition of the kingdom of God and all the virtues, or not. Or we live under the passions, and we are slave to our passions. And behind the passions, who are they? Who is behind the passions? The demons. The demons are the ones leading us to the passions and slavery to the passions. So the kingdom of God is present when we are healed. Asceticism is the presupposition for this healing. And what is asceticism? Our love for Christ. Asceticism is not only great acts of ascetic self-denial in the manathos, in the caves, and in the deserts of the world. That is certainly a great and amazing example of asceticism. But asceticism is when you have a child, and at two in the morning, she or he wakes you up, and you have to go feed him. And you do it prayerfully. That's asceticism. Asceticism, when you deny your desires for your brother's well-good, well-being, the poor person on the street, or your own flesh and blood, there are a thousand and one ways to be ascetics, because asceticism means love, true love for Christ, expressed in self-denial. There's no love without self-denial. Anybody who says, I love, and refuses to sacrifice, is a liar. They have not begun to love. This love that we hear about again so much today is not love. It's desire, it's sexual pleasure many times, it's uh, toleration uh, of sin many times, this is what they call love today. This is not true love. It's far from true love. So to whom belongs the kingdom? It is not just for those who are good, right? Christ did not come to make us good. There was a law, there were the commandments, and there was the moral law which brought us to goodness. And what I mean by goodness here is moral, uh, a moral and societal order and uh, doing uh, the, the golden rule. He came for much more than this. He came to make us holy. And what does that mean? To unite us to himself, to purify us, to illumine us, and to deify us. Far more than being good. He brought us up to heaven and put us at the right hand of the Father. Far more than being good. True love, therefore, is the cross. And this is the point that we, the Lord said we have to pass through this cross. Because this is this purification. This asceticism, this self-denial, is what's going to open the kingdom of God to you. In other words, my presence within you. And this is the, the end of the incarnation. That we dwell with him and we become sanctified, we become purified, we become gods by grace. So, in order to truly love, we are violent toward our passions. We hate our passions. How many of us hate our passions? How many of us hate our slothfulness? How, how many of us hate our selfishness? How many of us hate our indifference? How many of us hate sin? If you do not hate sin, how can you love Christ? How can you love your brother and sister? You have to hate sin. Those two go together. We have, it says in the scriptures, be angry and sin not. So anger which is normally a passion, when it is directed against sin, is not sin. It is the proper use of anger. If it's directed against your brother, it's sin. It's a missing of the mark. We'll talk about what sin is all about in a second. It says in Luke, the law and the prophets were until John, since that time the kingdom is preached, and every man presseth into it. You want to 
enter the kingdom of God, you have to press into it. It is not going to come easy. You have to deny yourself. It says elsewhere, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What is this poverty of spirit? This is humility. This is humble-mindedness. This is meekness. This, this is a violence against pride. This is a voluntary putting off of the passions and not having uh, the, uh, the wealth of this world, which is the passions, pride, arrogance, vainglory. Blessed are they which are persecuted for Christ, for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There are many, many references in the scriptures to what the kingdom of heaven is all about. He gives us many examples, parables that I cannot say all tonight. Read the scriptures, find out what the kingdom of heaven is, because this is our point. This is the point of our life. This is why we're here, to enter into this kingdom. It's not taken, and the kingdom of God is taken by force, it says in the scriptures. It's not taken by those who simply do good and keep the law. It's not taken by those who simply hear the word of God. It's not taken simply by those who speak about the Lord, like I'm doing tonight. This is not the kingdom of heaven. It's not even by those who preach the kingdom of heaven. Those, there are those who have preached it and lost it. It's taken by those who keep his commandments. And what are his commandments? Life. Life itself. The commandments are not something that is burdensome. It's not given because he wants us to be enslaved to him, but to free us from the passions. Their life, his words are life. The kingdom of God is not in word, he says, but in power. The presence of God within us. This is the kingdom of heaven. He says elsewhere in Matthew, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, so we hear the scriptures on Sunday morning, and we leave unchanged, and we understand it not, means we, it means we do not come under it. We do not submit to it. That's what understand not. right? Not just rationally getting it, but that we do not submit to the word of God, then cometh the wicked one, he says, and catches the way that which was sown in his heart. So the gospel is being sown every Sunday, every day if you're reading the scriptures, is being sown. The kingdom of God is being sown within your heart. But if you do not submit to it and make it a way of life, you lose it. It's like baptism. It was given to you. The kingdom of God was given to you entirely. There's nothing missing in the mysteries. Christ himself is given to every one of us. Holy, I said before, there's no division in Christ. In the mysteries, he is entirely present. What happens? Why are we not all deified? We receive the mysteries, and there's nothing missing from the mysteries. Why are we not all deified? Because we have not responded in kind with the love. We have not activated the spirit by purification, by asceticism, by love. We did not submit to Christ in all our thoughts, words, and deeds. So he taketh away, and he loses the seed of the kingdom. It says elsewhere, I say unto you that except your righteousness exceedeth the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you in no way will enter the kingdom of heaven. So this, again, is not about being good, doing the law. If we're doing only that, the kingdom of heaven is far from us. We have to go much further. It is about loving the lover who first came down from heaven and gave himself for us. Not every, everyone who saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The will of God, what is this? What is the will of God for us? Our salvation. That's the will of God for us. To be in communion with him. And how do we do that? By keeping his commandments. So he's, everything the Lord did was for our benefit. He didn't do anything for any other reason. Everything he does and continues to do for us, everything he allows to happen to our life, his will and that which is allowed to happen to us is for our salvation. Do not doubt it. Many of us do. We say, why, Lord? Why did this happen? Why did this person die? Why did this thing happen? Why did, this, why did I lose my house? Why, why, why? And therefore we, understand, we don't understand who God is. We don't understand his providence. We don't understand that he is like a surgeon operating on us every day to bring us into full health. It's not about being just a good person and doing good works. It's about becoming holy, becoming united to Christ. And here we have to say this. 
we have to say this because there are many of us who have this idea that because we're in the church, however we came to it, we're saved. We're okay. It reminds me a little bit of the Protestant delusion. You know, the, you've heard the evangelical Protestant who says, they say the words, they confess Christ, and now they're saved. It's all over. We're good to go. We have to be on guard for the chosen ones, the Jews, took for granted their inclusion only to lose their status as the people of God. He spoke to the Pharisees and he said to this, and this is to all of us, everything in the scripture is to each one of us. Don't ever think that there's everything said in the scriptures does not apply to us. It all applies to every one of us. This is the mystery of the gospel. It's never old. It's always present for every one of us. He says, but th what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented, and he went. And the second came and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. And he went not. Which of the two did the will of his father? He says to the Jews. And they said unto him, The first. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, The publicans... And the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when you had yet seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. Again, this applies to all of us. We are like the Jews in those days. We're born in the church, many of us. We were raised in the church, and yet we have taken it for granted. And others will enter the kingdom of God before us if we are not in constant repentance and return to God. He says, Many will come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom, and that applies again to all of us, do not think this is only for the Jews. If we are in this kingdom and we lose it because of our indifference, we are like the Jews. The kingdom, the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into darkness and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's talking to the chosen ones, the chosen people who had all the prophets. It's like we have all the saints, 2,000 years of saints. Every day we can turn, open up the Synaxodion and read the lives of the saints. They're all there witnessing to us. And this witness is a great responsibility. It means that we cannot say to the Lord, I did not know, I did not hear, I did not understand. You did not reveal yourself to me. It was 2,000 years ago, Lord. No, he's present right now in the world every day. And he's speaking to us and he's revealing himself to us. Many today take for granted that they are among the chosen simply because they have received the gift of baptism or the Eucharist without conforming themselves to the image of Christ or attaining to the likeness of Christ. You know that in baptism you were restored to the image of God. That was a gift of God. And now it is up to you to go from that image to his likeness. <clears throat> that is salvation in a word. That's the patristic teaching. We are we're given his image, it's restored, it was distorted, it was, it was, it was uh, marred in the fall of Adam and Eve. Christ restores it in baptism, but it cannot, we cannot be brought up with the likeness of Christ. In other words, to have the virtues, the power, the spiritual presence of God within us without our willingness, without our cooperation, without our good uneasiness, without our repentance, without our love. It's impossible. So we are given this. But now we have to realize it. We have to go from the image to the likeness. And we think because we receive the mysteries that that will happen automatically. It does not. Again, the presuppositions of the mysteries, there are many. Before we are baptized, before we are ordained to the priesthood, there are presuppositions we have to fulfill if the grace of God is going to come to us. One of the biggest problems we have in North America for those converts that are coming to the church is that we are not initiating them into the mystery. We are not purifying them in catechism. We think catechism is to learn about Christ. Anyone can learn about Christ outside the church. Any Protestant, any Roman Catholic, anybody no matter where they are, can learn about Christ. What's different with the catechumen? He is being purified so that when he receives the grace of the mystery of baptism, he 
lives the kingdom of God, it's a real event. He feels it. He, he experiences it. It's an experience, and he understands it empirically, the kingdom of God. It's not something he thinks about, wishes about. He lives the kingdom of God in baptism if he's been prepared. The priest's duty is to prepare them through purification. That's why it was three years in the ancient church before they were baptized. They had to go through a process of purification from heretical ideas, from heretical ways of thinking and living, from immoral ways of thinking and living. All of that has to be put aside, and there has to be much botho in Greek, much desire for Christ that has to be there. And then when they meet Christ in baptism, they meet Christ just like Everyone we read about in the gospel, there's no difference. Christ is not a respecter of person. He does not choose people in his day and age to have a better and more intense experience of Christ. Everyone in every age since the coming of Christ has the same possibility to experience Christ in his fullness. The total coming of Christ. In fact, we can experience him after Pentecost more than anyone that saw him walk in the face of the earth. They could not partake of his body and blood. They were not recipients of his spirit. Everyone after Pentecost has a more intense experience of Christ than before Pentecost. The question is, how do we approach Christ? Many approached him. Many saw him. Many listened to him. Many turned away from him. Many walked away. The rich man, his own disciples, when he turned to him and said, Eat my body and drink my blood, turned away from him. And this is the most amazing and beautiful part of the scripture for me when he says to Peter who he knows confess him and knows him he says Peter will you also leave freedom in Christ total 100% freedom he wants Peter to crucify his intellect and say where can I go Lord you have the words of life this crucifixion of the intellect is the door into the kingdom this submission this humility opens up the grace of God to each one of us and this is what we have to do to enter in so it's not a given because we've been baptized because we receive the holy mysteries there's nothing given at all it's a constant renewal of a relationship going deeper and deeper so as long as it at this these mysteries this grace sits dormant because it's not been activated by our love it's as if we never received baptism to begin with it's there but it's dormant. It's not active. This is the reason why we are here. This is the reason why this church exists. It's why this, that w this, this whole complex has been built. It's for one reason, for you to enter the kingdom of heaven. For you to enter the kingdom of heaven. And today we have amazing temptations which are trying to drag us away from the kingdom of heaven. And there are a thousand and one isms today delusions that are trying to keep, 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 keep us out of the kingdom of heaven, whether, they, whether we call them by syncretism or ecumenism or secularism or philatism. We can talk about this in the question and answer. What are these various delusions and, and impurities which keep us from the kingdom of heaven? Uh, all of this has to be put aside and we have to focus on the purpose of the world, of the church here in this world. So those who have remained uninitiated and inactive, they have essentially returned to the world. They live according to the fashion of this world. They live according to the mind of this world. And the, the mysteries are a closed book to them. They are, they are not known to the world, the mysteries, only to the initiated, to the experienced, the, the mysteries of the kingdom open. And he says to them, he says, it is given to you, he says to the apostles, to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it is not given. It is given to you because you have crucified your intellect. It is given to you because you have followed me and submitted to me, and this door, this mystery is open to you, but those who do not, it is a closed book. To the proud, to the arrogant, to the vainglorious, one has to become as a little child. It says, many, in many verses it says, Become as little children. Suffer the little children. Humble himself as this little child if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. You see, this, this child has not yet invested his mind and heart into the things of this world, into the riches and the glories of this world. He's simple. 
He has not given his heart over to these things. He is still attached to his mother and father. He is still simple and loves. And this is what we all need to become. If we are attached to these things, if we have invested ourselves, we cannot be free. When we, when we spend our time and our life acquiring things, then we have erected a wall between ourselves and God. He says in the Gospels, I say unto you, a rich man shall hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. Who is not rich among us today? Kings would have been jealous for the ease and comfort we have today with technology. When you hear the gospel, when it talks about the foolish rich man, apply it to yourselves and to myself. I am rich. I have ease beyond the imagination of the ancients. Again, kings would have loved to have the ease which we have today, the travel, the food, all of the technology. So we are in danger, brothers and sisters, when we attach ourselves to the things of this world. It says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because he has erected a wall for that kingdom to enter in and be actualized. He is attached to things and not to the Creator. We cannot serve two masters. We cannot have a split personality, be committed to God and to mammon. We have to commit ourselves to God. The kingdom of God, Christ reigning within us, admits of no other ruler, no other master. He says, let the dead bury the dead, but go and preach the kingdom of God. He says, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. He says, there is no man that has left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake that shall not enter therein. You see, you have to leave all this behind to be worthy of the kingdom. This, this, this is a missing of the mark. Sin, for most of us, means something very, let's say, uh, extreme. But in fact, sin is everything that instructs us to have communion with God. Sin is a missing of the mark. But what's the mark? Communion with God. Anything that obstructs our communion, the kingdom of heaven entering within us, is sin. It's a missing of the mark. We have strange ideas about sin. It's very simple. How can we attain to the image and likeness? Sin defaces the image. It is a departure from the likeness. It obstructs the king coming of the kingdom within us. He says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, St. Paul says, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate homosexuals, homosexuality, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. He means sexual impurity and sin that is very common today. Thieves, covetousness, drunkards, revilers, extortioners shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Some will say today, Paul is very strict. Paul is very uh, uh, hard on us. No, he's not. He's trying to free us so that we might have the kingdom of God dwell within us. When we do submit, trust, and give our heart over to Him entirely, we love Him with our whole heart, mind, and soul, then His grace enters and transforms us. And then He says to us, and with this I almost am finished, and I look forward to your questions and answers. He says, Unto what is the kingdom of God like? And wherewith it shall, it, shall I resemble it? It is like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and cast into his garden, and it grew and waxed like a great tree, and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches thereof. And he says again, What shall I like in the kingdom of God? Listen, pay attention, because this is what we want. We want the kingdom of God. And he's telling us, What shall I like in it? What is this? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal to the whole was leaven. What is this kingdom of God? It is the grace of God. And he says, when the grace of God dwells within you, it changes and transforms the whole of the bread, all of man. The whole man, the kingdom of God comes and transforms the whole man, or it does not come. It is not a partial coming. He comes with power and he transforms the whole man. Holiness, sanctification, illumination transforms the whole man. Not just the intellect. Not just the moral actions. Salvation because you're a good person does not exist in the church. Salvation because you think the good things and say good things and think right things does not exist in the church. This is not salvation, brothers and sisters. This is not salvation. But the mind, the soul, the heart, the body, the impulses, the glances, 
the decisions, the desires, the whole man is transformed. When you meet a holy person, when you meet a man who's been deified, you don't stand in awe because he says smart things to you. You don't stand in awe because he is morally correct. You stand in awe because his whole being has been transformed. He looks, you, looks at you with eyes that pierce you. His presence is the presence of God. You stand in fear because you understand that God is real when you meet a holy person. The whole man, the kingdom of God, glorifies the whole man. Think about that. Have we become deified to that degree? Then the kingdom of God is still not within us. It's not yet there. We still have work to do. It says in Revelations, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. This illumination, this shining forth of, with the Holy Spirit, this is the end of the incarnation. This is the end of our life in the church. This is the point of our life. And this is what we have to be working toward. And he says, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Come freely. Peter, what do you think? Eat my body, drink my blood. What do you think, Peter? What do you think? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Are we ready to open up our ears and our mind to have the kingdom of God enter in? It's up to us. No one is pressured. Whoever so will follow after me, pick up his cross and follow after me. Whoever so desireth. There's no forcing. You have to want it. You have to seek it. You have to love the kingdom more than all the passing pleasures of this world. Thank you very much for listening.